If you trip to the corner of Texas, no, not the corner at the top or the one at the bottom. No, not the corner out west or the other corner out west, but the corner to the east, the southeast in fact, the place where Texas and Louisiana almost overlap and where cowboys, Cajuns, and the coast combine. Also, where I grew up. Port Arthur, ships ahoy. <laughs> That's not even a phrase, <laughs> is it? <laughs> <laughs> This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Port Arthur is about an hour and a half east of Houston at the southeastern tip of Texas. It's a town that's almost as much Louisiana as it is Texas. And that's because, well, Louisiana is just right over there. But it was built to be one of the premier port cities on the Gulf of Mexico, and in truth, it is, especially in terms of oil, as the largest oil refineries in the United States are right here in town. But as we get into this day trip, you'll soon see that Port Arthur is much more than just Texas tea. Port Arthur is a melting pot of sorts and always has been, just like how the fresh Sabine River mixes with the salt of the Gulf of Mexico. Cultures, food, history, it all gets mixed up here like a big old pot of gumbo a special Southeast Texas type of Creole that's only found right here. So I gotta say like Port Arthur is not the kind of town that you accidentally end up in. <laughs> you have to intentionally no. go to Port Arthur because it's not on the way to anything. You gotta, you're going I-10 and then you take a hard right and you just go until there is no more road. Well, that's how I describe when I was like, where are you from, Chet? And I go like this. Look at a Texas map and go here. You know, I feel like you keep defending it, like it's an ugly girlfriend that you've had for a while, and she's got a great personality. You should have seen Port Arthur in high school, though. Back in the 90s, you know. Her glamour shots were amazing. <laughs> There's no avoiding it. Port Arthur looks rough these days. But hey, you would too if you were hit by a major hurricane every couple years. There are empty buildings all around, and empty slabs in a downtown that once boomed with businesses. Some of the beautiful homes still standing sing of the glory days past, as this area has some amazing history that few realize. And to learn about it, well, we're headed to the Museum of the Gulf Coast. This museum sits in an old bank building and is packed with artifacts and stories covering everything from, as they say, Jurassic to Janus. This is director Tom Neal. It's amazing how people come to the Museum of the Gulf Coast with an idea they're gonna come see Janus Joplin, which they're going to, but they're gonna see so much more. And then you tell the story of the Paleo Indian, the Clovis Points. You see Cabeza de Vaca. You see uh, this battle site of Sabine Pass, the oil scene of Spindle Top. And they end up spending the whole day here. This little section has been involved in pretty much every story of Texas. We think of it where it starts, okay, not where okay, it is. Yeah. And all that has an origin, it starts right here. That's incredible. Okay. Very cool. The bottom floor covers the area's history like a life-size textbook. Wildlife, Spanish explorers, oil, even the days when we had our own Texas Navy. But upstairs, it's a detailed who's who, highlighting all the amazing people who have come from the swampy waters of the Gulf Coast. From actors like G.W. Bailey of MASH and Police Academy fame, to artists like Kelly Asbury who animated Shrek, governors, Oscar winners, it's an incredible list. Is there something in the water? It sure makes you wonder about that, but you know, I would just challenge you to tell me someplace else in the world that this many people have had this much impact on the world that have all grown up in this Gulf Coast Crescent. A large majority of them living just right in this area. Yeah, yeah, that's the father of pop art. That would be Robert Rauschenberg, a name so big, he gets his own room. It's so strange, and a lot of people don't get it, but one of his pieces recently sold at auction for $88 million. That's a lot of money. 
How's it make you feel? Like my Crayola box got ruined because I left it in a hot car and all the colors melted together. So it kind of makes me sad. I'm emoting. All right, now here we're talking sports. People know these guys, Bum Phillips, Wade Phillips. You know, a lot of people know Bum as the legendary coach of the Houston Oilers, but he actually started coaching high school football down here. Coached both Nederland and Port Natchez Groves, bitter rivals. Man, cool, and of course his son, Wade Phillips. Hey, no big deal over here, just a Super Bowl trophy. Just a little Vince Lombardi trophy. You know, those things are in uh, pretty much every small town museum across Texas, not a big deal. This is awesome. If you're a sports fan, you know almost every name. Cowboys fans definitely know this name. Jimmy Johnson graduated TJ High School, class of 1961. Hey, you know what I'm not seeing? My high school letter jacket? It's just I'm not just in here saying, yet. I mean. They're having to build, that's what this is. This window is an extra case. Okay. It'll go in that window. But most impressive is the room of Gulf Coast music and musical legends. Hello, baby. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Big Bopper. The Winter Brothers. Look at these dudes. These dudes new style. They need know that right there. Adult bell-bottom onesie. That's something that should come back. There are simply too many to name with musical styles that hit every genre. But you can't talk Port Arthur music without the Pearl herself, Janis Joplin. Here she is, life size. I don't think she was this <laughs> no, short. No, I don't think so, Chad. All right, Pearl, tell me about your Porsche. I thought you wanted a Mercedes Benz, no? This is an almost exact replica of Janice's Porsche Cabriolet. She definitely had her own style. Janice Joplin went to Thomas Jefferson High School. Uh, according to her, she got out of Port Arthur as fast as she could, ended up in San Francisco, you know, and then pow, just a giant career, but very short-lived giant career. But her influence still to this day, people love Janis Joplin. People come into this museum because this is where Janis Joplin grew up. It's just proof that people from small towns can do anything. And it's less about where you came from and more about who you are as a person. And the people from the Gulf Coast, well, they continue to make history every day. Well, now I'm ready for some lunch. And all this talk of Cajun culture has me hankering for some classic Cajun cuisine. So let's stop into a place that's as Cajun as they come, the Boudin Hut. This is the kind of juke joint where everybody knows your name. You can shoot some pool, sing along with Kenny Rogers, and enjoy the house specialty, sushi. All right, I'm just kidding, it's Boudin. And here's the guy who started this little Cajun hideaway, Pat LaBeouf, back in the kitchen, making the good stuff. That's a big boudin bowl. Here, look, it's already got the spoon in it. There's lunch right there, guys. Ready to go. <laughs> For those who aren't familiar, boudin is a kind of Cajun sausage stuffed with dirty rice that's a mixture of many things delicious. What all goes in this? There's uh, pork, okay. pork liver, onion, parsley, and rice. And that's it? Yeah. Not, not, not a little special seasonings in there? Well, there's a little things I can't tell you all my secrets, you know, but yeah. <laughs> well, I've learned, like, there, people's boudin recipes down here are as secret as the formula to Coca-Cola. Right. Mean. So there's an art to this, huh? Yes, there is. You Cajuns had not figured out a way to mechanize this yet? Yeah, but we do it the original way, kind of sort of. Used to, when you stuffed it, you cooked it with a cow horn. That, that's the way my grandma and grandpa did. That, With a, a cow horn? A cow horn. And yeah. what, like a plunger? And you just yeah, go, stuff it in there. That's wow. the way they did it. Boudin is a tradition as old as the bayou itself. And for as many times as I've eaten it, I've never actually made it. Here, come on in and get to it. I oh, want gonna... you, yeah, to show you how easy it is, as you say. Easy, yeah, right? Take your hand right there and grab that right okay. there. And, and, and tie a knot in. Yeah. And then get you two or three turns, get you a link about that long. Two or three yeah. turns. Yeah, hold, 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 hold a little farm more now. Oh. All right, now back off. Back off of it. There you go, right there. All right. Pull it out and give me enough to tie. I thought it was hard to tie. I told you to give yourself yeah. three. Little party balloons. This is even harder than those little, those little like balloon animal things. We're making boot, boudin animals over here. It, it, bam. That's my first boudin link right there. So at this rate, I'm gonna make about two links an hour. <laughs> I don't know if y'all are gonna make much money if I was no, in the kitchen. No, don't look like it. You did a good job, though. 
It's best to leave making it to the pros. But at least I know I'm a pro at eating it. Oh, shit. Look at this. Like a Cajun four-course meal. I got boudin for an appetizer. I got boudin for the main course. I got boudin quesadilla for the second main course. And I got hog head cheese for dessert. Boudin makes me very happy. You and uh, Kenny <laughs> Rogers both look very happy. He's looking over my shoulder. You got to know when to hold him, when to fold him, when to walk away. I ain't running from this man. <laughs> you take dirty rice, you put it in the sausage casing, and suddenly it becomes a delicacy. A little bit of mustard? What? Oh, yeah, man. That's how it's done down there. Mm. So you can take the rice, batter it, deep fry it, it becomes a boudin ball. Ooh, yeah. Cajun boudin on a quesadilla. I can't argue with that. I'm gonna be honest, I've never had hog head cheese before. It's pieces of hog head shaped into the shape of cheese. So it, there's no cheese in it. Nope, it only looks like cheese. Mm, yeah. I kind of like really jellified spam. Go for it. All right. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Yes. It's got great flavor, though. It does have good flavor. You know, if you want a true Cajun experience, you find it in joints like this, right? I mean, this is where the real Cajun culture lives, man. They're doing it the real way, just like they learned on the bayou. Now interrupt this programming to remind you to like and subscribe. Now back to the road. How many ports are there in Texas? Ports. Port Arthur. Port Aransas. Port Isabel. Port O'Connor. Port Natchez. Port Mansfield. Lavaca. Port Lavaca. About Rock Rockport, does that count? Ooh. Good call. I, it that's a not a it, port eh? city, it's city ports. Yeah. That's a I before E situation, right? right? Port before city, except, except after port. rock. <laughs> exactly, except after rock. Rock ports, we're gonna count it. Count it. If you're smart enough, you can count up to 29 port cities in Texas. And this is undeniably a very busy port city. The ships and oil business never sleep in Port Arthur. And I'm gonna be honest, for those not used to it, it can look like a strange Mad Max post-apocalyptic world. But you'd be surprised that it doesn't take long to leave the industry behind and find yourself tripping into the near endless marshlands all around. And while Port Arthur is now strategic for oil, well, there was a day when it was strategic in a much different way. And that's the story of the Sabine Pass Battleground. On this site, during the days of the Civil War, the North and the South clashed in their struggle to control Texas. Here's Chris Elliott with the Texas Historical Commission. It's a unique site in that it's where kind of a natural resources and cultural resources collide. You know, not only do we have the best founder fishing in the state of Texas, it's also uh, the grounds for one of the most significant Civil War battles uh, in Texas history. Now, most don't think of Texas when they think of Civil War battles, but perhaps that's because of what happened here on this site. When a wily group of men, led by an Irish saloon owner named Dick Dowling, kept back a Union force that was a hundred times its size. And it all happened here where Fort Griffin once stood, securing the entrance to Texas. What we have here is a small replica of Fort Griffin. Fort Griffin was established to uh, prevent occupation from the, the Federalists into Texas, Got it. up the Sabine River. If the Federalists or the Union would have captured the Sabine River, they could actually came into Texas a lot easier. And in September of 1863, the Union made a plan to do just that sending four gunboats and 18 ships to Sabine Pass, carrying over 5,000 soldiers. When they came into the pass, they saw this earthen fort, and they started a barrage on that fort. The barrage lasted for over an hour, no return fire, nothing. They thought that the fort was abandoned, so they just kept moving down the river. What the Union didn't know is the Dowling and 47 men were holed up in the fort, patiently waiting it out to lure the Union boats further upstream, and hopefully, get them close to the cannon targets in the river that they'd been training on for a month. One of the individuals, the seamen on the ship, noticed this weird marker in the river. And he noted that as they come up on this marker, that the port opened up. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're, they're fishing a barrel right there, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. That ship rolled right up on it, and that's the Sachem. And then they just started that barrage for about 45 minutes. The Sachem gunboat was almost immediately sunk, 
And next, the USS Clifton was hit and wrecked on a sandbar. They rose the white flag and they were captured as prisoners Those of war. Those were captured, yes. turn, causing the rest of the other 5,000. Yeah, to turn around and go back to New Orleans. Wow. So, yeah. This battle is actually still taught in war colleges today because of the cunning and patience shown by Dowling and his men. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm by no means glorifying the flawed cause of the Confederacy. But what's indisputable is that without this victory, no doubt there would have been much more bloodshed here on Texas soil. Sabine Pass remained a strategic point for coastal defense, even after the Civil War. And these bunkers were built during World War II to store up ammo for our ships safeguarding the Gulf of Mexico. Germans had submarines in the Gulf of Mexico ready to attack the continental United States. We don't think about that. I know. Ah, mosquitoes. Yeah, watch out. It's a different kind of artillery. It's nature artillery attacking us, mosquitoes. Nature versus the day tripper. <laughs> mosquitoes aren't the only wildlife you gotta look out for. You see, you see this little guy? Where? Well, look close, man. I, I, I don't know. Wait on it. Hey, he seems pretty brave. <laughs> hey, buddy. He don't care that I'm here. I don't gotta be the fastest one. <laughs> I just gotta be faster than this guy. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there ain't nothing to worry about with them little gators. They ain't gonna bother you unless you go trying to bother them first. So we find ourselves just a few miles from the coast, and there's no reason not to stop in and smell the salt. So let's head to one of Texas's most remote state parks, Sea Rim. Over 4,000 acres of marshland and five miles of beachfront that's been completely redecorated by the recent hurricanes, but remains a hidden gem. And here's Park Superintendent Nathan Lundenberg. Hurricane Ike came in in 2008, and it uh, completely wiped out this park. It took the dunes out with them. It carved out these places where the pools are. And yeah. it's, it's added a new dimension to the park now. And we've been back open uh, for several years now, about six, seven years now, and for people to come back and start enjoying the park. <laughs> there were massive dunes, now gone. There are alligator pools where buildings once stood. It's like nature decided to pull a fixer-upper on the entire park. And while it is different, it feels more primitive and more beautiful than ever, and remains a great place to enjoy the coast. Central Beach right here is, uh, we have it kind of blocked off where there's no vehicles can drive through on the beach. Okay. okay. It's just foot traffic only, but further down, unlike other beaches, you can actually drive out on the beach. So I imagine after about a half a mile, you kind of have the whole beach to yourself. That's correct. And uh, fishing's wonderful out here. Did you bring your fishing pole? I did not bring my fishing pole. You got any other ideas? I think I have something else planned for you today. We'll, All right. We'll look for something else. I'm game. Yeah. Let's go. We're going crabbing, one of my favorite childhood activities. All it takes is some string, some chicken or a turkey neck, and a shallow pool of water. So yeah, just toss it out there. You just let it sit there. When it starts drifting off, then a uh, good chance you have a crab on it and you'll just slowly... Uh, slowly bring her in. Bring her in. Stand back, it's going far. Phew! I mean, I'm not bragging, but that was a perfect toss. Looks like it. <laughs> All right, now we wait. Now you wait. Now we wait. And wait, and wait, and wait. Sometimes they pinch, sometimes they don't. We are hunting crabs. Shh, be very, very quiet. But now, I think we got one on. There it is. <laughs> we got us one. Woohoo! Oh, this guy's down to one claw. See, yeah, he's, so I've he's got down to one claw. Got, All right, so but you can see he's he's well under five inches. He's, actually, it's a sheep. Sheep. <laughs> there she is. She's a monster. This is the the bounty of the marsh. Take a big old bite. I think uh, we're gonna let you go back into the marsh, okay? Just gotta get a little bigger. Go, go ahead. I couldn't come all the way out here without at least getting my feet wet. Ah, the chocolate waters of Sea Rim. It's almost heavenly. It's a little colder than I expected. It'll help with my bunion inflammation, you know? I tell you, the Cajuns can have a lot of fun with some string in the turkey neck. 
<laughs> Those are all, that's all you did? One even count? Yes. You had to put it back. Of course it counts. I noticed you made him pull it out of the net. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, so technically yeah. you weren't even crabbing. Oh, I, did, I, I had to pull the string in slowly. You've been stringing. That's the hardest part. Stringing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I felt like you were stringing That's us That's the along. hardest. Oh, nice. Dun -dun. Well, we definitely didn't catch enough crabs to make a meal. But don't worry, because I know a place where we can find enough crabs to feed an entire county for close to 75 years. And that's the Schooner Restaurant. Since 1947, the schooner has been serving up the freshest of seafood and Cajun flavors. The old photos and menus on the wall, along with the same old taxidermized fish I remember from when I was a kid, let every customer know that the schooner knows seafood. Constantine Megas and his kids carry on the Megas family tradition. Greek immigrants serving up Cajun seafood. Hey, I told you this place was a melting pot. And here's Constantine and his daughter, Maria. I came here in 1952 and I've been here ever since. A big Greek family serving Cajun food. That's yeah. right. That is <laughs> Southeast right. Texas. If you know anything about Greek people, you know that we love to feed people. So restaurants yeah. just come naturally. And they treat every table as if it were in their home taking the utmost care with every dish. We fillet snapper, flounder, we peel our own shrimp, we shuck our own oysters, yeah. sauce, we make sauce, everything sauce. here in-house. Yeah. Old school. Old school. I mean, really old school. We didn't change any of that. Yeah. So I saw the old menus on the wall. How much were oysters back then? They were 10 cents. 10 cents an oyster, yeah. <laughs> 10 cents a dozen. <laughs> a dozen. Oh, 10 cents a, a dozen? dozen. A dozen. Yeah. Oh gosh, you're like, just give them away. They're, I think there are seafood platters on there for like two Bucks. We're buying shrimp for five cents a pound. Then. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome. But we've seen generations dine with us. So my dad has seen parents, you know, grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren now celebrating all types of family events. They've grown up with us here in the restaurant. That's awesome. The schooner is truly an icon of Southeast Texas. And while every dish looks amazing, well, I'm here for a specialty that's only found in Southeast Texas, barbecued crabs. Invented in Sabine Pass, this local delicacy consists of blue crabs tossed in a zesty seasoned flour and deep fried. Now, I know that confuses many of you barbecue purists out there. I mean, there's no smoke, no fire, but hey, you can't argue with the golden brown deliciousness that is barbecued crabs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This guy's a little bigger than the one we caught today at Sea Rim. There's a lot of meat in here if you know how to get to it. You see that? See that in there? It's like this succulent, sweet crab meat with like a little bit of zesty Cajun sauce. You gotta get your whole hands in there and really get after it. And as you get into it, you just start kind of licking the fingers as you go through. Mm. That, my friends, is delicious. See, now that's a good bite. Got a little bit of breading on. Come on, little crab. Open yourself to my belly. Le poisson, le poisson. Wee, wee, wee. Oh. And when you're left with like a pile of crab guts and dust, then you know it's time to move on to the next one. Oh. You're supposed to be eating it like with friends at a table who are also eating the food and y'all are not eating. Y'all are just kind of staring at me eating, eating this. And so I get to pass along the tradition. Some may see Port Arthur as out of the way, but if that's you, well then maybe you should ask yourself what way you're actually going. Because if you want to explore the history of Texas, see the beauty and nature of our state, dine on its melting pot of flavors and experience it all from corner to shining corner, well then this is exactly the way you need to head. Time to steer your ship straight to Port Arthur. I knew we could do it. So I will see all y'all out on the road. Bye, con Dios, amigos. Yeah. Howdy, y'all. Follow along with my adventures at Chet Tripper on Instagram and at the Day Tripper TV on Facebook and YouTube.
or head to thedaytripper.com for travel guides, past episodes, and info on our mobile app and Team Day Tripper. This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Howdy y'all, Chet the Day Tripper here. Thanks so much for tripping with us. Uh, remember, while you're here, like this video, subscribe to our channel so that we can stay out there on the road and keep on tripping. <laughs> Did we miss anything in this town? Leave us a comment, let us know. We love finding out about new stops with all your tips. And if you love Epic Texas Day Trips, remember to check our channel. We got a lot of them on there. Also, don't forget, if you want some sweet Day Tripper merch or another cool Texas made product, Come see us in Georgetown at the Day Tripper World Headquarters. You can also shop online if you check the link down there in the caption. All right, y'all. Bye, Condios, amigos.